wisdom, power, and love, our God. Father God in heaven, in Jesus' name we come, Lord. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you, Lord God, for reigning. <laughs> we thank you, Father, that you have blessed us again and you've entrusted life with us one more time. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless us as we come to hear from you, Father. Lord, you're the great God. You're the great King. You're the one who keeps us and molds and makes us. We ask you to bless us as we study your word, that your word will fall on good soil, that we, Father God, will be better than we were when we showed up. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. He reigns. He reigns. Oh, God, isn't an awesome. Matter of fact, he's not an awesome God. He's the awesome God. He is, he is the awesome in the amazing God. I guess Sister Davis thought I need a whole heap of Bible up here. Uh, one won't do me. She, uh, Brother Whitlock, would you go toward the back for me? There's a mic. Sister Davis, can you go turn that mic? Uh, the red button. The red button on the top of the mic that says Sister Davis on it. Amen. We're looking at James chapter 5 tonight. Turn it down a little bit, please. James chapter 5. I know what the problem is. James chapter 5. James chapter 5, verses 13 through 18. James chapter 5, verses 13 through 18 is where we are looking tonight. We're start, still talking about prayer, right? This is a month of prayer. We're still talking about prayer. To, last week, we talked about prayer and salvation. This week, we'll talk about prayer and praise. Amen? Prayer and praise. James talks about prayer as he closes out chapter 5. He, he kind of closes out uh, his book with uh, prayer. And within prayer, he talks also about praise. Amen. Hallelujah. When we look at prayer and we look at praise, the two great weaknesses in the church today is prayer and praise. Amen? These are two great weaknesses in the church. Prayer and praise. There is so much we need to pray over. There's so much need for prayer, but there is so much that should cause us to praise. Are you with me? So there's a need, there's, a, there's much need for prayer, but there's so much that ought to cause us to praise. Is there anybody in the room that needs prayer? Is there anybody in the room who needs to pray for somebody? Is there anybody in the room that's, that needs praise? that need to praise God, that need to praise him for who he is, praise him for what he's done, praise him for just being God. So that all encompasses all of us, right? Trouble should cause us to pray. But sufficiency ought to also cause us to pray. What I'm saying to you is, you ought to pray when you're in trouble. But I'm also saying to you that you ought to pray when you're not in trouble. Trouble, despair, discouragement ought to cause us to pray. And we see it often here in the United States of America. We all come together in prayer when there's tragedy. People who hadn't prayed all year long. December 31st, tragedy takes place, they pray. And there's nothing wrong with praying in tragedy, but we also ought to pray in the midst of good times, sufficient times as well. So, so James, James called this last meeting right before the last pericope. He calls this last meeting verses 13 through 18. Uh, James chapter 5, verses 13 through 18. He calls this meeting and he says um, that we ought to pray. So he begins verse 13 by asking a question. He says, is anyone among you 
suffering. Some translation will ask the question, is anyone among you sick? Is anybody in this room suffering from something? Is anyone among you suffering? Is anyone among you sick? Is anyone among you ailing? Then he answers, he says, let him pray. So he says to us, don't wait on other folk to pray for you. If you're sick, you ought to pray. If anyone among you sick, anyone among you hurting, if anyone, on, anyone among you who have problems, let him pray. Then he asks another question. He asks, is anyone cheerful? Anybody happy? Everybody got things going right for them. Is there anybody got something going right for them? Is anyone among you who are cheerful? If you're cheerful, you ought to sing psalms. You ought to rejoice. Because we know that being cheerful doesn't happen every day, all day. So if you're cheerful, you ought to praise him. Verse 14, is anyone among you sick? Remember, in order for the pericope to carry on integrity, it has to stay with the same thought, correct? So he begins by saying, is anyone among you suffering? Is anyone among you cheerful? Is anyone among you sick? This passage has been so misunderstood for so long, hopefully God can clear it up tonight. This word sick refers to morally sick because of the word in the Greek, morally sick and spiritually sick. Spiritually and morally weary. Spiritually and morally worn out. Remember, we're talking about an attitude of prayer. We're talking about prayer and faith. We're talking about prayer and praise. The only way you can praise in the midst of trouble is if you have faith. If anyone among you sick, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil. Let them pray for him. So this word sick means that is there anyone among you who have, have moral issues, who have spiritual issues? You know anybody with a spiritual issue that need prayer? He's saying, if you know you got a spiritual issue, you need to call for the elders of the church. Elders of the church are the spiritual leaders of the church, those who are, are spiritual enough to offer direction for those who, who reside in the church, who worship in the church. So if anyone among you sick, anyone among you who have moral issues and spiritual issues, let him call for the elders of the church. The problem is when people are sick, they won't tell people. Very few people will tell people when they are spiritually sick and morally sick. I even tell Sister Davis, don't you tell my story, let me tell my story. Well, you need to tell people because they need to be praying for you. Well, let me decide who I want praying for me. Now, when I get incapacitated, if that ever happens, then she gets to choose. <laughs> but we, especially men, have issues with telling people when we got something wrong with us. And if we have a problem with telling people when we got something wrong with us physically, how much more do we reluctantly tell people when we got things going on with us morally and spiritually? I say to you, you need at least two, three people that you can go to and tell them your spiritual and your moral sickness. Can you think of three right now? Can you think of three people that you will trust with your issue? Trust with your attitude. Trust with your spiritual walk. Trust with your moral, moral failures. Are there three people in your life that you can trust? 
Because when you get to the point down here where it talks about confess your thoughts one to the other, first thing I think about is Instagram and TikTok and <laughs> Facebook. And why, do I, why, do, why do I think about that first? Why do I first think of that? When, I, when it talks about confessing your thoughts one to the other, what do you think about? Why, why do I think about that? I know somebody know why I think about that. Why do I think about that? Confessing my faults one to the other. What? Okay, so people, people have a way of telling other people business on different platforms, right? And so we have to make sure that we, we got somebody, number one, that we can report to that will, will hold us accountable. Number two, somebody that we can hold accountable. And then somebody that we can be friends with and, and walk down the road together. I know some of you didn't grow up in the country, but in the country, they would tie two bulls together and, what, and they would put wood around their necks in what was known as a yoke. They would yoke two together. And usually it's a young and a season. They would yoke them together. I actually had the privilege, the honor, the opportunity to walk behind a, a animal and plow down the field. I mean, actually walk with a plow in front of me that would plow two rows at a time, maybe three at the most. And so what, in order to train a brand new animal, what they would do, they would put a seasoned animal next to a non-seasoned or a young animal, kind of like on the job training, and they would plow together, and they would turn together. Because when you plow, you don't turn and come right back down the same or the opposite row. You have to plow and go down because you got to make the turn. When they use tractors and combines now, they don't go down this row and come right back next to it. They plow, they make the turn, and they may leave six rows between them. And then when they make the turn coming back, they'll come back on the other side, and then they come down that road next to them. Are you with me? So they would have a training session. So there ought to be somebody that you can be trained by. There's somebody you ought to train, and then there's somebody you ought to partner with, walk down the road with, work with, that you can share your weaknesses. So he says, if there's anyone among you sick, let him call for the elders of the church. And when you call for the elders of the church, allow them to anoint your head with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, this is not a big ceremonial thing here. The oil is not the representation that we see as medicine. It's not medicine. It is encouragement. It is the anointing as one is passing the torch. It is the anointing. It is the anointing with oil, meaning that I'm here for you. Because the elders of the church are there to encourage the timid. They're there to encourage the timid. And they are there to help out the weak. What if we had a church? What if we had thousands of churches, millions of churches, that had elders who would honestly be there to encourage the timid and to help out the weak. I mean, literally to help them out. I mean, literally to be there for them. So the elders of the church are there to encourage, to refresh, and to lift up. And that's what the anointing is all about. We are here, we are saved, we are sanctified, we are filled with the precious Holy Ghost so we can make sure that we lift up other people. That we encourage other people, that we refresh them. So the anointing is the refreshing. Because people have fallen into discouragement, people have fallen in, into this and to devastating situations, people have fallen into distressed situations. And when one falls into a distressed situation, they need somebody to lift them up, to encourage them. People have to get off this thing about, well, I'm, 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 I'm able to handle myself. I'm able to do this for myself. 
Because there are going to come a day when you are not able to do it for yourself. There's going to come a day where your spirit just drops so low. You need a phone call. You need a text. You need encouragement. You need somebody to sit with you. You need somebody to talk to you. Have you ever had those days? Or am I the only one in the room? Anybody? A day where you knew that you were still saved. You knew that the Lord still loved you, but you needed Jesus with some skin on him. You needed somebody. And some people are just good at saying things at the right time, the right moment, or sending you something at the right time. And they don't even know what's going on, but they are encouragers. God is looking for us to encourage each other, to walk with each other, to be there for each other. So he says, call for the elders of the church, anointing your head, their head with oil, in the name of Jesus. We, we're at James chapter 5, verses 13 through 18. James chapter 5, verses 13 through 18. Verse 15. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. There's that word, save, and the word sick. We're talking about people who are hurting. In the 21st century, people are hurting like never before. People have issues that we personally have never seen before. People going through stuff right now that they've never gone through before. And much of the things that we are going through are not things that we brought on ourselves. Life happens. And when life happens, things happen, people happen, distress takes place. And when life happens, you begin to wonder, Number one, where did I go wrong? Number two, who put me in this situation? Number three, God, what have I done to deserve this? Usually, it's nothing that you've done. It's just life happens. In John chapter 9, Jesus is healing the blind man, and the Pharisees wanted to know Lord, what did he do or what did his parents do? Who sinned, him or his parents? Because it was a known fact, sometimes when parents sin, they have babies that are deformed. And so they wanted to know from Jesus, this man was born blind. Who sinned, him or his parents? Jesus said, nobody did. This was done so that God would be glorified. That's why we pray, and that's why we praise. And you cannot wait till you are blessed of the Lord Amen. in order to praise. You ought to be praising with the enthusiasm now, even before you get what you want. You ought to praise him. This book, this book that we, we journaled through last year, uh, Fix My Prayer Life, written by around 20 different people, some I know, some I don't, and so this book on page 25, Fix My Prayer Life, uh, Antonio T. Dixon Sr. writes, Susan was floored by two brain aneurysms. She was, she was upset, she was floored, she was in distress because she had two brain aneurysms. And now we run around here arguing about water. We arguing about mulch. We arguing about dirt. We, we arguing about how big a house we're going to live in, what, what size house, what location of house. And Susan had two aneurysms. And let me tell you, when you have two aneurysms, your house size can't help you. Your bed size can't help you. Who you're married to, unless he or she are praying people, they can't help you. So Susan had two aneurysm, and for weeks she lingered on life support. She was growing weaker and weaker medically every day. Her children were called to her bedside to say goodbye. When the doctor said call the family, he's not calling, telling you to call the family so he can tell you your diagnosis. He's telling call the family so he can tell you your prognosis. He says call the family. So when Susan uh, 
Susan was on life support for a long period of time and suddenly she snapped out of her coma. Ah, uh -huh, my, my. She snaps out of her coma, her coma and she asks the question of her husband, where is everybody else? He said, well, baby, you know, they only let one of us in ICU at a time. She said, no, they all were here. I heard them. They were speaking at the same time. Uh, and, and it was hundreds of them. So he knows now she's not talking about the family. She's in a coma. She says, I heard them. She says they were all speaking at the same time. There were hundreds of them. They were all around me. They were here. Susan discovered that a prayer connection was called for her. Some call it a prayer chain. Was called for her while she was on life support. And she realized it was the prayers of thousands and hundreds of people that brought her through. That prayed for her during the time she was in the hospital. James teaches that God will answer the prayer of those who are faithful and those who have faith. So you have to have faith in order for your prayers to be offered. The other day I was praying and, and sometimes my schedule gets like a, a conveyor belt. And so in between time, I can't get upset with the person that I'm dealing with, and therefore I have to pray. So my prayer became on this given day, Lord, bless my time to be perfect timing. Lord, I'm waiting on this lady. She's not moving fast enough. Matter of fact, she's not moving at all. She's looking at me and seeing me stand here, but she's still not moving. I don't know what she's doing, but I know she's not taking care of my business and I got to be at this next appointment in a matter of 20 minutes. Lord, bless the timing to work right. And God blesses the timing. And one thing I say about that is if you, can't, if you don't pray, your prayer can't be answered. If you do not call on God, your prayer will not be answered. If you do not tell God about it, your prayer will not be answered. Many people think that God's not concerned about little minute things. Have you seen athletes get down on their knees and pray before, during, and after games? You do know they're not praying, Lord, help that other team to win, right? Yeah, for the most part, they're praying, God, bless us to be healthy, uh, take care of us, bless us that it will be a safe game. But at the end of their prayer, brother, what do you think they're praying? Now, Lord, even if they're the better team, we want to win this one. And they, they pray over and over again. If you don't pray, God can't answer it. But if you do pray, God will answer. So you, you, you call upon God, the Lord that we serve, we call upon him in prayer, and we trust his prayer. James tells us that prayer has impact. Even when we think that the impact would not make a difference, prayer has impact. So what we have to do is make sure we pray. Honestly, we make sure we pray with humility and make sure we pray in faith. Because prayer has impact. What you're saying when you pray is, it's not that I'm trusting in a high power. You're saying I'm trusting in the God who has the power. Oprah calls on a high power. In Kosciuszko, Mississippi, she was taught about this God, but now this God is a high power, a higher power. But he's the same God that brought you over. He's the same God that built you up. So we got to call on that God because he's the God of power. He's the God of power. Brother Antonio Dixon, Dixon goes on to say that true believers know how to praise God. 
Then he says, healthy Christians are Christians who know how to praise God. Then he makes another round and said, the happiest people I know are not shy about praising God. He said people who are happy people, people who are, who are healthy Christians, people who are true believers, these people are not shy about praising God. Are you shy about praising God? These people who are happy people, these people who are happy, healthy Christians, these people who are true believers don't care where they are. There's a lady back home that mama rides with, they call her push. Push is uh, really is, is, is Miss Stuckey. Now, Miss Stuckey, she doesn't care where she is. We, we put Miss Stuckey on her first video. When, when videos first started being published, published on the internet, we put Miss Stuckey on her first video. And boy, she was just as loud then as she is now. She doesn't care where she is. And then the author says, Dixon says this, he says, he says, don't care, don't, she don't care where she is. She doesn't care who is present. She doesn't care who is looking. She gonna praise God regardless of where she is. A lot of people be trying to avoid Miss Push. They be trying to move around when they see Miss Stucky coming. Uh, we, they came here a few years ago, two bus loads of them came here a few years ago, and, and Sister Stuckey can sit back there in the back, but you're going to hear her up front. And so after they left, we went home for, for Thanksgiving, we walked through Walmart, and we were walking through Monarch, hey, ain't you the preacher's wife? Hey, aren't you the preacher's wife? So... It doesn't matter where she is. It doesn't matter who's with her. It doesn't matter who she sees. And finally, it doesn't matter what she sounds like. Because prayer is so powerful that praise comes right along with it. Doesn't matter where she is. Doesn't matter who she's with. Doesn't matter who sees her. Doesn't matter what she looks like. It doesn't matter what she sounds like. True, healthy Christians, they just know they have much for which to praise the Lord. And they got to praise on the inside and they just got to get it out. You got to praise on the inside of you and you just, you just got to get it out. I mean, you just, you just, Lord, I thank you. And sometimes it just spills over. You don't mean to be loud, but once you get loud, you don't care. Never will forget my, my last day when they, they were laying people off and, and I had gotten my three components together because I was slowly taking stuff out every day, you know, because I had come to the conclusion that if, if I'm no longer there, it's okay. And so that day, I walked out with my apple, my cup, and my breakfast bar. And when they called my name, you know, they, they surround you with a bunch of folk because they, they don't know if you're going to go postal or, or go homely or whatever. They don't know what you're going to do. So they called my name, and this time I guess they thought I was in my right mind. They called me in the room, and human resources was there, and the manager was there was there well we've decided I'm saying in my mind let's get let's get it over with we've decided that that we are going to lay this person off and you're one of those people okay and they waiting on me to to ask why they're waiting on me to 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 get frustrated I said thank you for the time here appreciate it well Matt you you want me to walk you to the door no that won't be necessary Well, Matt, you know I'm HR. I have to walk you to the door. I said, that's fine. She gets me to the door and she looks at me. Are, are you okay? Oh, yeah, I'm just fine. And so I, I had to make sure that, that I left the right way and that it didn't matter who I was with. 
I praise the Lord for the time here. And it was three years to the date. I mean, I've been laid off before, and so this is just a, a stepping stone for me. What well, we have to understand that God wants us to praise as we pray. And God wants us to praise in the middle of our prayers. And God wants us to praise as he gives us what we've been praying about. So it says, if anyone among you sick, call for the elders of the church. Let them lay hands on you in the name of Jesus. Another thing Dixon says, Dixon says this. Your praise to God, whether it is singing, speaking softly, or communicating with God silently, is a form of prayer. So we ought to, we ought to praise him in our prayer. We, he's looking forward. He inhabits the praise. He just wants the praise. He, you know, anybody that's going to do anything good for you, sooner or later you're going to have to say, thank you, I praise you. I, I worship you. I, I, I just thank you for being good. God, you are the awesome God. I'm talking about God. I'm not talking about people. So in our prayer, we ought to praise him. It says in verse 15 that the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. Raise him up. This word raise him up is referring again to the sick. The ones who are morally sick and the ones who are spiritually sick. Do you not know that there are people who are morally sick and spiritually sick right among us? Even in the church house, there are people who are morally sick and spiritually sick and they need Jesus and they don't know how to get there and they're looking to you, the elders of the church, to get them there. In the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up. And if he has committed sin, now he transitions to sin. Again, he's talking about your morals and your spiritual walk. If he's committed a sin or if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. The God we serve is a forgiving God. We make mistakes. We mess up. And sometimes we intentionally mess up. We know we're at the wrong place. We know we're with the wrong people. We know we're saying the wrong thing. We know we're doing the wrong thing. And guess what? God forgives us. In one seminary class, a guy raised his hand. The, the professor, I'm just sitting in at this time. I'm sitting in in the class. The professor is teaching. And all of a sudden, it comes to forgiveness and one student said, hey, professor, you know, God will forgive you for everything other than the unforgivable sin. He said, well, brother, what, what's the unforgivable sin? He says, homosexuality. And I looked and I said, and he leading people. So some people have con concluded that this particular sin that they don't like is a sin that God won't forgive you for. But what we have to understand is the only way we don't get forgiveness is if we do not turn to God. If we blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, meaning that we don't turn our hearts toward God. We don't allow God to speak to us or we speak ill of him. It has nothing to do with homosexuality because guess what? Homonging is just as bad as homosexuality. Are you with me? Stealing is just as bad. It, when you're living a lifestyle of sin, we still need Jesus. We need Jesus for everything. A woman did a video the other day, said, somebody asked me, do I need Jesus to go to heaven? She said, brother, you need Jesus to go to Walmart. You need Jesus to pump gas. You need Jesus to walk the street. Yeah, you need Jesus to go to heaven. <laughs> Do I need Jesus to go to heaven? Yeah, you need Jesus. You need Jesus just to go to Walmart, just to pump gas. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses, confess your sins to one another. And pray for one another 
that you may be healed. Look at, the, look at what he says. Confess your sins one to the other. Confess your sins to one another. Confess your trespasses. Confess your, your trespasses one to the other. That's why I say you need somebody you can talk to. The reason why people commit suicide is because they don't, they don't have anybody to talk to. They just they shut themselves off or people pull away from them. They have no one to talk to. But we need somebody, number one, to hold us accountable. Number two, we can walk down the road with and join. And then number three, somebody that can, can be our accountability partner that, that can hold us accountable. So we need somebody to look up to, somebody to look across to, and somebody to follow us. So we need to be godly examples. We need to be mentors in somebody's life. Pray for one another. Confess your sins. Pray for one another. And he that has sinned shall be healed. The affectionate, fervent prayers of a righteous man availeth much. The affectionate, fervent prayer and prayers of a righteous man availeth much. So it also says we have to be godly examples when we pray. We must be righteous. We must be. The affectionate, fervent prayer of the righteous avails much. Prayer is effective when it is used properly. Prayer is effective when it is used properly. Prayer is effective when it's a fervent prayer. It accomplished much. What does it mean by fervent prayer? Fervent, fervent. Where do we get that word fervent? Heat, right? Excited. We ought to be fervent in our prayer. We ought to be consistent. We ought to be excited. And we ought to be on fire for the Lord in our prayers. Then he, verse 17 through 18, he talks about Elijah. When he talks about Elijah, we have to realize something. Elijah was not a god. Elijah was not an angel. Elijah was not a superhuman or superhuman being. Elijah was flesh like you and me. Elijah had troubles like we have. Elijah was a sinner like we are. Elijah was a natural man. He was a man with a nature just like us. But look at what Elijah does. The one thing that Elijah did that separate us from from, separate him from other people is that he believed in the power of God and working through prayer and God's ability to work through prayer. Elijah believed in the power of God and he believed in God's ability to work through prayer. Can we believe in God's ability to work through prayer? Can we trust God enough? As human beings to work through prayer. Look at, he believed God. When you look at 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1, it records how Elijah, Elijah said, it will not be rain until I say so. Elijah said, it's not going to be a drop of rain until I say so. Remember, Elijah's not a god. Elijah's not an angel. Elijah is not a superhuman being or a super being. He is a man just like you and I are with natural feelings just like we have, but he trusted God. He says, not going to rain again. Went to King Ahab and said, look, King Ahab, you're the king, but it's not going to rain. Because Elijah trusted in the king of kings. He says, not going to rain. Then Elijah prayed again. And what happened when Elijah prayed again? It rained. Elijah says to King Ahab, it's going to rain. And guess what happened? Rain began to fall. It's because of the power of the Lord and how the power of the Lord used Elijah. We have people who tried to use the power of God 
for our own benefit. Brother Miles talked about it on Sunday. We, you know, when you, when you have a prophecy, all prophecies are not going to tell you, hey, what's, what's this and what's that and how blessed you're going to be. Sometimes prophecies say, now look, and if you've been following your reading, your daily reading and your daily, your daily Bible listening, you will see very good, very obviously that God move upon those he's not pleased with and he moves in what we would call a negative way. Every prophet of the 20th century and the 21st century that I've heard, every last one of them promised money, promised possessions, and promised prosperity. Every last one of them. None of them address the issue at hand. None of them address sin. All of them skirted around it. And then they said, in the morning when you wake up, this week, the Lord has said to me in seven days, in seven days, you will be blessed like never before. How many children you got? Two. The Lord says, don't worry about those children. Now, how many parents got grown children they still worry about? So he never told me anything. I hear the Lord saying that somebody has a heart condition. If you got 10,000 people in the room, what's the chance of 10 of them having heart conditions? The Lord told me that there's somebody that, that haven't walked in a long time. I mean, you're sitting there looking at wheelchairs. They didn't just roll them in there for cause of fashion. So Elijah was just a man. But he had connection with God through prayer and he trusted the power of God and that God will operate through prayer. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Verse 17. And he prayed honestly that it would not rain. First of all, he prayed to the almighty God. So he knew who to pray to. He knew to whom to, to pray. He prayed to the God who's able to stop the rain. He prayed that it would not rain and it did not rain. It did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Years, three years and six months, it did no raining. Now he's telling the president this. <laughs> he's telling the dictator this. He's telling the king this. It's not going to rain. Verse 18. And he prayed again. And the heavens gave rain. The heaven gave rain. And the earth produced fruit. So while it wasn't raining, it was a drought, and the earth didn't produce fruit. Without rain, it couldn't produce fruit. When it began to rain, the earth began to give up fruit. Why can't we have a prayer life like that? Did it go out in the Old Testament? Or can we call on God now, and God can answer our petition? My last point. Prayer is more than a quick statement. Prayer is more than a quick request. Prayer is more than God, please bless me and my family today. Prayer involves intimately weaving God into every aspect of our lives. That's what Brother Dixon says. He says, prayer involves intimately weaving God into every aspect of our lives. Some people say, Lord, you can come over here, but sit down over here. You can't come over here. Don't mess with this thing. But when you pray and God hears you, he hears you and he can answer your prayer. Because God wants to hear from you, and you need to hear from God. Any questions or comments? So we ought to pray, and we ought to praise. And we ought to praise in the midst of prayer. That's why Jesus says when you begin, when you begin your prayer, you ought to start praising God. You ought to praise him. If nothing else, you ought to praise him for Jesus. And what he did on Calvary. Jesus died. He was buried. 
he rose and he was seen. And that same Jesus made it possible for us to live a godly life. Now, may, there may be someone listening today who have not trusted Jesus as your savior. This is your moment. Try Jesus. If you want to try Jesus, just join me in this simple prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for our sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you prayed this prayer, we believe that you're born again, that you're on your way to heaven. If you're looking for a church home, I recommend the New Beginning Church. Let us know if you want to be a part of this body of faith. Our prayer for tonight will be done by Brother Miles, and our prayer is for those who are sick and bereaved. Those who are sick and bereaved. Father, we bless your name today. Lord, we just thank you for being God all by yourself. We thank you for being a good God. We thank you for being a merciful God. We thank you for being an all-seeing and all-knowing God. And most of all, we thank you for being an all-powerful God. Lord, we come before you on this evening, dear Master, lifting those who are sick, those who are bowed down, dear Master. Those who are struggling, dear Master, whether it be with a physical illness, a psychological illness, a mental illness, or a spiritual illness, dear Master. Lord, we come bringing them before you, dear Master, before the throne of your grace. Because, Lord, you know. You know where they are, and you know what can be done in order to save them, Lord. Lord, you are a God who heals. We have seen that time and time again in your word. So Lord, we ask right now that you would touch, that you would heal, dear Master, according to your perfect will. Dear Master, that you would do those things that will bring glory and honor to your name in each situation, dear Master, that your people face. Lord, help us to know that you are in control. Help us to know that you know all about what they face, dear Lord. Help them to know that you know the end, dear Master, from the beginning. And you know, dear Master, that you will do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, Lord. Lord, let them know that you will do what is necessary for your glory, dear Master. Help each person, dear Master, as they go through these situations in life to just hold on, to trust you, dear Master, to lean on you and to depend on you. And Lord, we are confident that you will touch, that you will heal, that your glory will be revealed the lives of those, dear Master, especially those who have asked for prayer, dear Master, in the situation that they are going through. Lord, we pray for the bereaved families, dear Master, those whose loved ones have gone on, dear Master, to their final destination. We pray, dear Master, that you would comfort them, that you would keep them, that you would let them know, dear Master, that, again, you are in control, that matters of life and death are in your hands. Lord, if their loved ones, dear Master, have accepted your Son, Jesus Christ, as Lord and Savior, that 
they have nothing to fear. That on the other side, dear Master, is a better place than on this side. That you have promised that you will receive them into your kingdom, dear Master. And dear Master, you have not, not gone back on anything that you have promised, Lord. So we come praying your comfort, dear Master, your peace on those family members, dear Master, as they deal with the loss of a loved one. We know, dear Master, that they will miss them, dear Master. They will miss their fellowship. They will miss their friendship, dear Master. They will miss their love. But, dear Master, we also know that you have a home in glory for them, dear Master. And if the loved ones, the relatives, dear Master, know your son in, their sin, in the part of their sins as well, dear Master, that they will see them again on the other side. Lord, we're confident that you are the same God of the Bible who has healed in the past, dear Master. And we know that you are still God and that you're able to heal right now and in these times as well. Lord, we commend ourselves to you, dear Master. We commend the sick, we commend the suffering, dear Master, and we commend ourselves, dear Master, to you. Lord, we give you glory, we give you honor, and we give you praise on this day. In the precious and strong name of Jesus, we ask these things. Amen. Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Brother Miles. Thank you for being in church tonight. Thank you for tonight. Let us continue to pray one to the other. One thing I do want to make perfectly clear, that there's nothing wrong with praying for those who are physically sick. Amen. So we want to lift them, as Brother Miles has tonight, lift them in prayer. Because we have this confidence that we have in Jesus Christ, that anything we ask according to his will, he hears us. And if he hears us, Whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that which we have asked of him. Amen. Amen. Thank God. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. It is now offering time. It's time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. It's a good time to celebrate the gifts of the Lord. Amen. <clears throat> if you want to give electronically, you can do that by giving by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. If you want to mail in your gift, you can do so by mailing it to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. 77459. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to give. We thank you for every giver. In Jesus' name, amen. And thank God. Amen. Thank God for another privilege, another opportunity to be in church on Wednesday night. Hallelujah. It's a blessing to be in church. Amen. I want to ask you again to pray for the Woods, the Wallace, and the Davis family, as well as the Hemingway family. Keep our family in prayer as we go to to finalize my cousin who got caught in a crossfire amen i'm telling you your your um, your best day of your life could be the last day of your life you don't have to be sick enough to die because there are people out there with guns that can't even buy a drink but they can buy a gun they can't even get their driver's license but they can they can buy a gun so on this week we saw i think a five-year-old baby walking around with a gun and he still got a diaper on. He walk around with a gun all up on his, around his neck, walking outside in the apartment complex. He's, he's five, I think he was five. He may have been younger than that, five years old. He's walking around, pointing, going, and you could hear the gun clicking as he was pulling the trigger. He, it was a loaded gun. And he's pulling the trigger all around his neck, all up in the air. So we need to make sure that we continue to pray because we are seeing things. I thought I had seen it all when I saw this little 10 year old walk into the gas station and say, I want all your money. He got a motorcycle jacket on, a motorcycle helmet. He got a gun, he's gonna rob. 10 year old gonna, gonna rob a gas station 
And one of the customers just walked behind him and said, boy, give me that, and took it from him. And then now we have a six-year-old that, that has taken and shot his teacher because he, he was upset. And now, a few days later, we have a five-year-old walking around with a gun saying, pew, 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 pew. and you can hear the trigger just going off. And, and uh, then when, when the police officer gets there, the dad said, we don't have a gun. Then the lady shows on her video camera, see, he is this baby. So they go back and they arrest the father. So I want to tell you that we live in some perilous times. We live in some, some tough times. So let's continue in prayer. Why don't we stand and be dismissed? Father, eternal God, it's in the name of Jesus Christ, we know that if we pray, you hear us. We know, Father God, if we pray according to your will, you will answer us. We know, God, according to your will, Father God, as we pray, you will give us our petition. Now we come praying for souls to be won. We pray for sickness and disease to flee. We pray for the health of our church, that you will give us even more stability. We thank you, Lord, for 30 years of ministry. We thank you, Lord, for being with us and standing by us, that no weapon formed against us have prospered. Now, Lord, we ask you to continue to bless us to be in unity. Bless us to continue to unite the church. Bless us, Father God, that we will walk with you and be blessed by you, Father God. Bless our church, Father God, that our church will be a praying church and a praising church. That lives will be saved and committed to you. That hope will be renewed and restored. And Lord, we look to you for, Lord, we realize that you're the only one who can help us. And we trust you, Father God. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling. Unto him the only wise and only true God. Unto him be power, be glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us all say. Amen, amen. We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. You are dismissed. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.